So this evening, we're going to be talking about Kono Jiko. And um, every, many people realize I like to try to include a, a, a woman, um, a Buddhist woman, uh, you know, periodically, every, every few months at least. And especially some contemporaries. It's easy to, to talk about um, women in the historical <laughs> context, but it's a little bit more difficult to talk about with some of the contemporary. And, and some of the reasons for that are that there's not a lot being published, uh, not just about them, but things that they, and not say that there aren't a lot of women who are writing but many of the women who are writing are not necessarily practitioners. They're scholars and they, they're, they're interesting from one perspective. But Kono Jiko uh, is interesting because she was a person who had died a few years ago. She died in 2010. Her, her dates of her birth and death were 2031 to 2030 an opportunity to speak to her at least on one occasion and to assist the, the Kono family uh, at one point. I don't, I don't need to go into that, but she was a really interesting woman in a number of ways and a more of a contemporary figure. And she, I'm just reading now from the handout, which the people didn't receive if you didn't get the link. So I guess that's a good thing. Um, she received Tokido, which is ordination, in her mid-30s. And she received it by a very famous uh, Japanese uh, cleric named Yamada Itai, who was the Sasu, which is the leader of Tendai Buddhism. And so she had received Tokido from Yamada Zasu, who was the 250, 253rd Tendai Zasu from 1974 to his death at 100 in 1994. And by the way, he was relatively young when he was made Zasu. And that was when they decided that they better not have young Zasus anymore because they lasted for 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> and that can upset the balance of those who are more conservative versus those who are more uh, progressive. Um, no term limit. <laughs> if you don't have a term limit as being a Zasu. So since then, you usually you have to be around 85 to become Zasu. So they know you're not going to last too many years. But in his case, he was around for, for 20 years as Zasu. And he was very influential. He was a person who was um, very much interested in making Tendai an international school of Buddhism, among other things. And um, But she... He was her mentor, and that becomes really important. She was also interesting because she was the chairperson of Kono Chemical Company in Osaka. She was married. She raised three sons during this period of time, and her eldest son, who was a dentist, she had three sons, two of whom were dentists, and the youngest son became the Jushuku of the temple became the abbot of the temple that she founded in Osaka. And the name of the temple was Fukuju San Jikoji Temple in Kyoto. And so here's a woman in her mid 30s who had taken ordination. And this was during a time in which she was raising three children. And she was the chairperson of the board of Kono, uh, Kono um, Chemical Company. And Kono, Kono Chemical Company was a, is, is a pharmaceutical company. So in the, the book that I'm using, which, could you hand me that? The book that I'm using, I don't know if, if you can see this or not, um, is called, okay, is called, Right View, Right Life, Insights of a Woman Buddhist Priest, and it's translated by Jay Vardaman at Kose Publishing in 1998. So you can, you can see the book. Um, 
And that book that was published in 1998 was one of several that she wrote in Japanese. That was the only one that I'm aware of that was ever uh, translated into English. She wrote numerous articles for publications, for newspapers, but they were all in Japanese. And I have to say, doing work, doing research, I should say, on Kono Sensei was, was not the easiest thing to do, even getting things like birth date and, and death date, because um, that she lived during a time in which there was not a lot of social media. She didn't have a social media site. And so you don't have the typical stuff to refer to. Um, I'm using the book, and this book has been out of print for some time now, as a way to discuss the remarkable woman who's a Tendai Suryo. I don't recommend that people obtain it. It's not that, that you would be scandalized or anything if you could, but it's not a book that I think is easy for a, non, for a person who is not very familiar with Japanese culture to read on a number of levels. I'm, I'll discuss that a little bit a little bit later. The book's notable be, for its contemporary interpretation of the Buddhist path, and this is partly what she was known for. She, in this book, exemplifies the idea that her goal, when she had become ordained, was to be able to present Buddhism in a way that the average Japanese person could understand it, and to sort of fill in a little bit on that. Um, in Japan, Buddhism is what, is what is referred to as a bracketed language. That is to say, it uses a lot of, of terms that are unfamiliar to the, the average person. And it makes it sound much more complex than it, need to be, than it needs to be. And so the fact that she was explicitly trying to setting out to explain the things most specifically to her Sangha in the temple that she had originated, founded, but also in general uh, to others, um, is really an interesting story in and of itself. And it's one of the things that I wonder if, when I'm discussing women in Buddhism, if that's not one of the characteristics of women in Buddhism, is that they very often attempt to explain things in language which is not difficult to understand. I'm going to, to just read a short piece of the review, of, of a review, to give you a feel for the book as a whole. Drawing on her many years of experience, not only as a priest, but also as a daughter, wife, and mother, Reverend Kono helps readers find practical advice on such issues as child rearing, family harmony, old age, and death. Her teachings are honest and straightforward with examples that are both delightful and moving. And so I think that that explains not only the book, but probably explains a bit about um, Kono Sensei. What, what were our views on child raising and death and stuff like that? Well, I, I'm not sure. Well, I'm, I'm going to be talking about that a little bit uh, as we go along. Um, not, not specific things, but how she addressed it in just a few minutes. But I'll discuss the book itself uh, initially. After a forward by Yamada Zasu, and, and by the way, I found that the forward that was by the Zasu was really um, worth reading in and of itself. And a prologue by the author, the first chapter addresses gratitude, gratitude to her parents, her ancestors, gratitude to the Buddha's path. And gratitude is a recurring theme in the book. And this, of course, is a prominent theme in East Asian Buddhism as a whole. And I, I think it's one of the many lessons that Buddhists in the West have yet to fully grasp. I think that if there are a number of distinctions that I could make between uh, Buddhism as it's practiced in North America and in Europe, uh, and Buddhism as it's practiced in, in East Asia specifically, is that there is a great deal of 
emphasis upon gratitude. And, and, and among the things that I find that that, that, that affects in, in very interesting ways is, for instance, <clears throat> in Japan, during the month of July or August, depending upon where one lives, one, one uh, participates in Obon. And the Obon ceremonies come from actually a term in Chinese called Urabana. But the Obon ceremonies, people refer to as ancestor worship, which really is not ancestor worship. It really is gratitude to the ancestors. Gratitude that I, meaning that the person is, can say, I am who I am today because of my parents, but also because of my grandparents, because of my aunts and my uncles, great, great grandparents, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the gratitude is shown by going to the um, cemetery where one's relatives may be buried, one's family is buried, and cleaning the tomb. And this is done typically four times a year. The tomb is cleaned and various um, prayers are said. And also the daily um, session at the Butsudan in which one is talking to one's departed uh, family members. Uh, it's a, a form of gratitude. It's a form of seeking solace in some cases. And, and by the way, in the book, she's asked specifically in a, in a separate section by a fellow named uh, Becker. And Becker did a really good book on uh, Buddhist, uh, it's called, I try to remember now exactly what the title is, something like The Turning Circle. And it's a, specifically about Buddhist views of death. And Becker asks her whether she thinks that people in the West should be celebrating or not celebrating, but um, observing Oba. And she says, absolutely. And that's part of the reason that she gives is that how can you really have a Buddhist practice without a sense of gratitude? And if you're not doing that for the parents, then you're really short circuiting your Buddhist path. And, and she's pretty, pretty direct about that. And by the way, uh, Jiko Sensei was a person who had been in the States quite a bit. She actually started a temple, a Tendai temple in uh, Los Angeles, which then closed after her death because she couldn't find um, someone to take it over. But she had been in the States. Her sons had trained, had gone to college in the States. So she had familiarity with the United States. She wasn't somebody who was speaking abstractly. She had a really good idea. And many of her, uh, from what I understand, she traveled to the States quite often and lived in the States for some periods of time, primarily around the Los Angeles area. Anyway, are there any questions that people have or any thoughts before I continue on? Uh, many of the convert Buddhists in North America got started in the 70s, and there was quite a generation gap between uh, the older generation and the younger generation. And uh, while some of that may have cooled, cool, there's still like uh, blocks that have to be overcome. I can't see myself putting my, I restrict, respect my parents, but a lot of things they wanted me to do, I'm not, I'm not doing so. It isn't, it hasn't been, they've been helpful to, I mean, I wouldn't be here. I'd be in a, a Christian church if I, I was doing what they want. Right. Uh, but maybe I am doing what they want. That's what, that's what I'm saying, even though. And and I think that's why that Obon kind of, you know, respect for, for what the parents, the product of, of your upbringing is it, kind of broken down in, in North America. And maybe Europe too, but definitely North America. 
Well, I, I, I understand what you're saying, and I, I, hear, I hear that, but at the same time, I think that she's addressing in a way that you're not even imagining. Mm -hmm. And the way, the reason I say that, and, and some people here have heard me talk about this, but it might be of interest. I remember when I first, when we first came here 26 years ago, and I did the meta meditation, the, medita the, the formal way that you do the meta meditation is you begin by imagining the suffering of one's mother. And you imagine the, the mother who is pregnant and, and, and it's summertime and she's got to take a bus and it's hot and it's sweaty and she's suffering to carry you in her womb while she's getting on the bus and going about her business. And then as time goes on, you imagine when you're a child and you're running into the street because kids do things like that. And how she, the fright, the degree to which she was frightened by that. And, and you imagine that suffering and you extend to her um, loving kindness, compassion, et cetera. And then you imagine when you're a teenager and you're the typical bratty teenager and you don't listen to what she's trying to say to you. And she really does have an idea of what's best for you, but you're not going to listen to it on and on and on and on and on. You know, you can imagine that's the meta meditation. And so I was really surprised. And I never really questioned it. I learned it when I was in Japan and I never really questioned it. And nobody in Japan ever questioned it until I started hearing from people. And they'd say, why do you always start with my mother? That's the hardest. I have such a terrible relationship with my mother. Why don't you start with somebody easy? Right? Why start with my mom? Well, from the perspective that she's talking about gratitude, showing gratitude to that woman who bore you, suffered with you, is a real form of gratitude. It, is, it isn't about how we reconstruct this and how we project onto that person. It really has to do with just loving kindness, which is free from any kind of, of attachment that we might put to what our mother provided us. And I think that that's, that's, that's a different form of gratitude than I think that you might have been thinking about. I'm just using that as an example. Let me, let me any other questions or thoughts? I'm looking behind us here. Oh, yeah. Well, it was no, just uh, just that. I mean, you're just talking about your, just your mother, whereas they're talking about ancestral worship, so which could be going back to uh, of that generation, father, aunts, right, uncles, grandfather, etc. You know, yeah. grandparents, etc. I mean, I always remember you talking about how many of us may know where our parents are born, but do any of us know where our grandparents are born? Right, and. Or even further back. And, I, I, you know, whereas in Japan, it is cultural norm for that to be one place or for people to know. At the, least. To, the tomb has been your family tomb for hundreds and hundreds of years. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, that and that and that's true. Anyway. Yeah. They don't move around much. In Japan. <laughs> well, they do they now. Do. They, they just do go back. back. <laughs> they did for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the following chapters, talking about the book, the following chapters weave Buddhist philosophy, history, worldview with common sense advice. And here's the point. It's common sense advice on raising children, family harmony, aging, Buddhism and daily life, and holistic health care. All of the topics are firmly grounded in Buddhist teachings intertwined with the difficulties people find in daily life. And, and, um, uh, uh, Chip had asked the question, well, what kind of advice does she give about raising children, et cetera? And, and so one of the things to keep in mind here is that she's looking at all of these issues, such as aging and, and death, through a Buddhist lens. She's not trying to give advice that a pediatrician might give or that a child psychologist might give or someone like that, but she's giving advice based upon here's the Buddhist teaching and here's how it applies to this particular problem of raising, raising the children. 
for instance. In other words, she's providing concrete information to people about issues that concern them. And I think that that's what's really important. Um, and she's addressing families. How do you maintain family harmony as, you know, as an example? And I, I heard a snicker Sorry. over here. You can't see the snicker because of the mask. I heard a, a snicker. Um, well, she's using Buddhist, Buddhist teachings and saying, you know, if we, if we actually interpreted the teachings in a way that we can apply to daily life, maybe they would make more sense than if we just have abstract um, ideas about this. And I think that this becomes really important. Um, where did the book go? Hold on a second. Um, now, I have to say that some of the advice I find pretty schmaltzy. Um, I can say that it's still Rosh Hashanah. Well, yeah, well, it's not quite Rosh Hashanah yet. Um, but some of it's pretty schmaltzy. But at the same time, I find that um, it's, it's addressing issues that people have on a daily basis. Um, I'm looking for some, for a particular spot that, um, well, here's an example. It is advisable for people to plan for a peaceful old age that will spend, spend in good mental and physical health without losing their mental acuity or working person. The idea of a start planning is five years before retirement. I always recommend this to people gathered at my temple, G Jikoji, and try to offer each of them suitable advice, preparing someone who is working full time <laughs> for what is often referred to as one second life, also meaning advising him or her how to avoid growing senile for a diligent company employee who retires at age limit, losing the very reason for living and having nothing to do often triggers a sense of being out of touch with the world. And then she talks about what it means to have a second life. So it's that kind of common sense advice that she's, that she's dispensing here. All those topics, as I said, are grounded in Buddhist teachings intertwined with the difficulties people, people commonly have. What's interesting is, and this is, is, is really interesting to me, what's interesting is that she does not make this a self-help book. Rather, it's a look at how Buddhist teachings address the issues. Look at suggestions, not how I, the individual, can better cope but how I, a bodhisattva, can assist others. So rather than, than being a self-help book that's filled with all kinds of things of, here's how you can make your life better, she really concentrates on how you can help make other people's lives better. And that is a Buddhist perspective. It's not self-help. It's how do you do this as a bodhisattva? How do I assist others and mitigate suffering that I find around me? And this distinction is sort of the antithesis of self-help. She's trying to get people to not concentrate on the I, but concentrate on what can I do for other people? That's real, and, and in her, in the Buddhist context, that is self-help. So if one is suffering, employ more gratitude for what others have done for you and forget oneself by working for the benefit of others. That's a really strong message in here. That too often what we have is, uh, and I'm, I'm reading between the lines of part of what she's saying, quite often what we do is we buy a self-help book to say, how can I solve this problem I'm having, whatever it might be? And what we end up doing is intensifying the problem. It exacerbates the problem as opposed to relieving the problem. And so what she is saying is, if one is suffering, employ more gratitude. Don't try to find the blame for why you're suffering. Employ gratitude and forget oneself by working toward the benefit of others. And I, I think that that's a really important message that we should really think about seriously. Um, 
recently I was having a conversation with someone and, and they said to me, well, what can we do to help people um, help themselves? And, and that's exactly what I thought about is stop thinking about woe is me and thinking about the gratitude of what has been done for me in so many wonderful ways. And if we begin to do that, then the problems that we seem to, to be experiencing are lessened. And then once we forget ourselves in the process and do it for others, now we really accomplish something. <laughs> and I think that that's one, of the, that's one of the major things that she talks about. There's also a chapter named, uh, titled, A Prayer for <laughs> Heart. And this examines aspects of Japanese Buddhism concentrating on four important figures to her. Now, as a Buddhist scholar, I wouldn't necessarily choose all four of these as if I were going to only choose four as the most important four figures. But to her, they were the most important four figures. The first is Saicho, the founder of Tendai Buddhism. The second is Kukai, the founder of Shingon Buddhism. And these two figures are from the beginning of the Heian era at the end of the 8th century. Then there's Ipen, founder of the G sect of Pure Land Buddhism in the 13th century. He was originally a Tendai monk who became an itinerant monk who traveled the countryside preaching Pure Land and promoting Nembutsu practice. And the fourth was Gyokan, who was a quiet and unconventional <laughs> Zen Buddhist who lived much of his life as a hermit. And he's best known for his, his poetry and his calligraphy. She pointed out the admirable aspect of each of these figures. And there's also a section on how every living thing is imbued with the spirit and Buddha nature, providing a delightful story of an old and withering pine tree on the temple grounds. And this pine tree, and this, this I think is, is an interesting little story. In the temple grounds was this old pine tree, and it seemed to be withering more and more. Every year it seemed to look worse, get worse. And she asked the gardener, what should I do to help out this pine tree? And he said, cut it down. There's nothing that you can really do for it. It's old. It was several, several hundreds of years old at the time. There's not much more you're going to do to, to help it. And from her perspective, she realized that every living thing has spirit and has Buddha nature. And so here's what she did. She actually got some sake and she put the sake into a spray bottle. And every day she would go out and she would spray this pine tree with sake and she would read to it sections from the, <laughs> I know it sounds crazy, but I, I found it to be a delightful story. But she, so she sprayed sake as an offering to the pine tree and saying to the pine tree, you have something to live for. And she would chant one of the, so the, the section of, of canon, the cry regarder from the Lotus Sutra. And, and several other um, sections about Kanon Basatsu from different sutras. And then she would talk to it and she would say, thank you very much for being in this garden for hundreds of years. I really appreciate the fact that you've brought your beauty and your life to this garden. And obviously, if you've lived here for so long, you must be very attached to it. It must be very comfortable for you. And so I want you to know that you're very important to this garden and I want you to thrive. And so if you can, please continue on. Now, this was a tree that the gardener already said, it's hopeless, forget about it. After a few years, it flourished and was working once, <laughs> once again in a, in a wonderful fashion. And so that's just a, a wonderful little story about, we, we talk about the fact that there's sentiency in rocks and streams and clouds and trees, 
but we often don't act upon it. In this case, she acted upon it to revive this pine tree that had been there hundreds of years. And so when she talks about in this chapter that's on a prayerful heart, the examining Japanese Buddhism, she also talks about one of the factors of Japanese Buddhism is this notion that everything which is within the earth is sentient and requires the same kind of loving kindness that we, <coughs> that we give people in the same way that, that you might assist a, a child who's ill and provide it with nourishment and, and encouragement. She was doing that to this pine tree in the same way. The final chapter, uh, I'm sorry, did somebody have a question? No, oh, okay, I thought somebody said something. Does anybody have a question? online so so now you know what to do if your pine tree isn't doing well <clears throat> the final chapter is titled karmic connections and this is a brief autobiography of how she became a sorio kona sensei was born into a family that had many buddhist clerics as members historically and contemporaneously as a matter of fact epen that i mentioned previously that she writes about in her previous chapter was one of her ancestors. His family name was Kono. And I won't go into all the family members who are clerics. I mean, she talks about uh, one of her cousins who was the head priest of a Rinzai Zen temple in Kamakura, of her um, grandfather who was a very devout Shin, uh, Shingon Buddhist, of another grandfather who was a very devout Tendai uh, Buddhist, about a number of them who would become uh, monks and nuns. And I won't go into all of it because there were so many and it's, it's pretty involved. She specifically talked about the close relationship she had with Kukai, the founder of Shingon Buddhism, Kukai being from the, the late 8th century into the 9th century and founding of Shingon Shu and how she felt a, a very close relationship with Kukai and with, with Shingon Shu. Um, and she talks about various family members from a long ancestral lineage as having karmic bonds. In other words, Epen was not just a family member that had, you know, that everybody knew, oh, well, we're related to, to Epen. And Epen, by the way, was the founder of the G School, which is a school that has very few adherents in Japan today. It was very much overshadowed by Jodo Shu and Jodo Shinshu in Japan. Um, but she sees rebirth and karma and writes about it throughout this, this text. She relates many, many things back to karma and rebirth. But when you read it, she also sees karma and rebirth as a long ancestral lineage of karmic bonds from one generation to the next. And she sees this rebirth as both genetic as well as the lessons that are passed down from one generation to the next. That has to do with rebirth also. And I think that that's a type of rebirth that we often don't think about. How, what we have, the rebirth, what we learn from our grandparents is those ideas are born again within our generation if we listen to them or our great grandparents. I can still personally remember my great grandfather, Sandy, uh, he died when he was 103, I believe it was. And so I knew him when he was in his 90s, uh, visiting him in North Carolina on the farm. And I wonder the degree to which some of those things that Grandpa Sandy told me are a way of Grandpa Sandy continually being reborn, not as the person, not as the personality 
but as the ideas and the wisdom that he contained. And so she talks about it in that sense. I mean, she doesn't really get into the genetics of it, but when you read it, you can read how she sees it both as something of a metaphysical perspective, but also as that genetic perspective. And her writings on the pure land are a mixed mixture of metaphysics and cosmopolitan sensibilities. One of the things I like about her writing is that she doesn't feel it's necessary to create a linear logical uh, narrative, that she's willing to uh, explain how she feels, recognizing that maybe it doesn't make sense, but that's okay. This is how I feel about it. And she viewed many of the events in her life in a mystical fashion. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons that she had become a priest, and it's, re it's uh, revealed in this chapter, is that she had a meeting with Yamada Zasu, um, whom I mentioned before. Uh, and Yamada Zasu, in her first conversation with him, he said to her, you have the uncanny ability to speak directly to the Buddhas and you should not waste that. And that's why she went on to become a priest because of Yamada Sensei, Yamada Zasu. And so you can see the, the mystical aspect of that. But she, if she had not been filled with a sense of faith and belief, then the words by Yamada Zasu probably would not have had an, an effect uh, at all. That she could speak directly to the Buddha, not the historical figure. What she was talking about, what he was talking about, wasn't you can speak to Shakyamuni Buddha. What, sh what the Zasu said to her was, you can see into the Buddha realm. And the wisdom that comes out of you comes out of that realm. So in that sense, it means that her practice was sufficiently strong that she spoke through the layers of this corporeal being in a way that belayed the, the wisdom that she had already attained through the many practices that she had done. And Kona Sensei's message reflects a deep abiding faith in the Buddhist teachings, a sense that karma and rebirth are not abstract metaphysical theories, but concrete realities. They are instructive as to how we should lead our lives. And I think that this is one of the messages that she has to give. And that is that many of us hear the term karma and rebirth, and we immediately shut down our mind. We stop listening. If we open our mind and listen to what the person is saying directly, taking it at face value, there is a wisdom that can be found in that that we can't find in other ways. And if you think that I'm being overly dramatic by this, remember that the very <coughs> basis of Buddhist practice is based upon karma and rebirth. So these are concrete realities that are instructive as to how we lead our lives. And that for her, being a woman, a wife, a mother, a corporate ex executive are fundamental to her being an effective Soryo. She was able to take all those different influences from her life and put them into a way that helped others recognize Buddhist teachings. So she ran her company, her temple, and her family based on Buddhist principles and practices. Her temple and her life centered on gratitude and giving of oneself. Now, are there any, any comments or questions before I move on? No?
My personal view of the book is that it's an inspiration to many people who have encountered it, especially women who have families, work, and are not sufficiently encouraged to engage their beautiful, their Buddhist practice more diligently. And I suspect that many Buddhists, American Buddhists reading this work would be put off by its devotional aspects. And I say this because she is unabashedly true to Buddhist teachings in a way that we seldom see outside of Asia. One must be free from the skepticism and cynicism that is common in a secular world in order to absorb the message that she conveys. When reading works such as this, I suspend my disbelief. That's something I learned years ago. If I encounter some things that I may seem foreign to me for whatever reason, I suspend my disbelief. This requires true humility, a lack of intellectual arrogance, and a willingness to admit, I don't know. So I can soak in the wisdom that it offers. That's why I'm not sure that many American Buddhists reading this would appreciate the message that she's giving because they're not willing to suspend that disbelief and accept at face value what she has to say. And she was a remarkable woman, a Soryo, that we can learn much from if we choose to drop our preconceived notions and accept her teachings at face value. And so I wanted to present this work about Kono Jiko because it's a, a work, it's a book about a truly remarkable, she wrote the book, and but she was a truly remarkable Buddhist woman who was very accomplished. And her temple that she founded in Osaka is still being um, run by her current son, or her third son, youngest son. Um, by the way, all of her daughter-in-laws took vows as well as all of her sons. And I think that says something about her also. So any final questions or thoughts? Nothing? <laughs> I guess, I, guess uh, I must have presented it so well that nobody's got a question. Brian, yes, Brian, you have your hand up. Yeah, um, I guess when you were saying you were thinking about uh, like taking care of others, I, yeah. uh, there's a play many, many years ago called Marvin's Room about a sister who's taking care of her very, very difficult and eccentric father. And it, toward the end of the play, um, it was written by a gay man who was, had AIDS at the time and who was taking care of his lover who also had AIDS. And she says, you know, um, I, I just love him, you know, the father, you know, even though he's difficult. And, and, and you know, I hope that he knows that. And, and the, her other sister, who has, like, come into town, says, oh, I'm sure he knows you, you, you love, that, you know, that. And she says, no, no, I love him for the opportunity he's given me to take care of him, you know? And, and the playwright, Scott McPherson, who died shortly after he wrote it, once, once said, he says, um, our friends have AIDS and we will take care of each other. The less sick caring for the more sick. And, and to me, that's part of why I love Buddhism, because it gets you out of yourself and says, no matter what you may be thinking or suffering at this moment, every time you meet someone, is an opportunity to lessen their suffering. And, and Western culture teaches us that everyone, every, every time you meet someone, it's an opportunity to get something for yourself, like to instrument, instead of instrumentalizing the person, which Western culture says to us, Buddhist culture says, make yourself of use to even to the person who is in the checkout line that you're buying your meat from. 
Thank you, Brian. Any other final comments before we call it an evening online? Uh, Xenon has a question. Huh? Xenon has a question. Oh, Xenon, please go ahead. Um, it's a bit of a silly question, but how do you spell her name in kanji? Because I thought to try maybe read some of her books in Japanese as a practice. Um, I'd have to ask Swami, do you know Swami? G is that the compassions? G, G is compassion. Ko. And then the light, the ko, ko. And ko is light. Oh. Thank you. Ko no, do you know? Ko, no. ko is a really common Japanese name, family name. It's a river and field. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Tamami. Any other thoughts or questions? Well, if not, then I'm going to ask the folks who are in the room to head on out to the hondo, and I'll give a very brief <clears throat> Dharma talk. Anyway, in the August Shingi, I wrote in the meanderings about some of the effects of 9-11 in our lives, in our society, the military industrial complex, et cetera. And I spoke about the 9-11 memorial as a kind of milestone in our lives and mentioned some others. One of those others is the pandemic. There are people who are younger than 20 years of age who will know about 9-11 and the aftermath, but they didn't really live through it. But it was not a milestone in the way this pandemic is a milestone in their lives, in all of our lives. The comparison between them two milestones is interesting because the ways our society has dealt with those two disasters are so vastly different. 9-11 was a totally human-made disaster that assaulted American society on many different levels. To be sure, there were people who were living in New York City at the time of the attack who suffered greatly from anxiety and stress. Many had PTSD. A number of our Sangha members are in that category. They had difficulty sleeping. They didn't want to go to parts of New York City. Many people at that time moved upstate to be away from potential danger. But overall, a response was a sense of social solidarity by the people in North America, a solidarity with allies around the world that could see themselves in America's position. The pandemic is what we assume is a natural disaster, a virus, that spread quickly as a result of human incompetence. And then human divisiveness, political, not trusting science and other issues that I don't need to go into now, exacerbated the disease and further separated people in a way that in my lifetime, few things have done. In other words, the 9-11 disaster had a unifying effect and the modern industrial societies overall, while the COVID pandemic has had the effect of separating and intensifying already present divisiveness. We're a different society today compared to 2001. We, the Buddha Dharma instructs us in the nature of impermanence. And it also teaches us about the nature of suffering and not to avoid suffering. There are teachings on not attaching to what we like and not attaching to what we dislike. There are lessons on how we can gain a sense of calm, peace, equanimity in the face of disasters. Those lessons are useful and they can mitigate the damages to our emotions and our psyches. But we still confront anxiety, uncertainty, and loss. That said, we must abandon the notion of Buddhism as a self-help program but rather see it as a way to better place our lives and those around us into a perspective that is, a, that is constructive and healing. Not just how we feel, but how we affect those around us. That's the bodhisattva path. Accept your feeling as they are, 
but also try to better understand the stresses on those around you. We have all been affected irrevocably by the events of the last two years. I know I have. Not a world we chose, but one that's been thrust upon us. Understand and do not be attached. Develop a deeper sense of gratitude and humility. Working for the benefit of others is the only way we will adapt effectively to this new world. There is no self-help without helping others. Svaha.